Good morning and welcome to Art Savere. As a consumer, when we go to the market to buy a product or a service, we are assured of its quality if it meets a desired standard. Let's begin the program with this thought for the day. Standards build trust. And to help us understand the importance of standards in our daily lives, we are now joined on the program by an eminent guest. Please welcome Mr. Sergio Mukika, who is the Secretary General with the ISO. Good morning and a very warm welcome. Good morning, Matt. Very Pleasure is entirely ours, sir. ISO is the International Organization for Standardization. So let me begin by asking you, what is an international standard? An international standard is a set of specifications about certain product or certain process that make uh, everybody understand the same thing when we're talking about that product or when we're talking about that process. So just to give you an example, when, 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 when you go to the supermarket, you need certain quality for the food you buy to make sure that you don't get ill. Yes. Or if you buy toys for your children, you need to make sure that you are buying something that is not going to harm your child. So you need to make sure that uh, there is certain standards, certain quality, which is uh, uh, what you expect. So will you say that standards are integral <coughs> part of everyone's life? Oh, definitely. Standards are everywhere when you go to the supermarket, when do you go to the shopping center, when you go to the street, the traffic light, the traffic rules, everything. So in India, we have the BIS, Bureau of Indian Standards, yes. which is the national standards body of India. And then we have the ISO, yeah. How does an average viewer understand the distinction between the two? ISO is the International Organization for Standardization, and we represent 161 countries. Okay. So in each of those countries, w you have what, do, what we call the National Standardization Body, which is one organization per country. In the case of India, it's BIS. But each country has its own national standardization body. When you put all those 161 countries together, you come up with an international organization such as ISO. And the beauty of it is that we believe in international consensus. What I mean is that great things happen when the world agrees. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's the tagline of ISO, that great things happen when the world agrees. But is it easy to get 160 plus member bodies to agree on a certain standard? Consensus has never been an easy thing, but we see a lot of value on that. That's why it takes some time to develop standards, because we first of all need to invite all relevant stakeholders. We need to invite all experts. We need to try to convince everybody that this is the best approach we should take or not. So that takes time. It's not an easy process, but the beauty of it is when we have achieved an outcome, everybody agrees on that. But um, let's reflect back on history. It was in 1947 that the ISO was established. You know very well. <laughs> BIS was a founder member because yeah. it was also established in its erstwhile capacity around that time. So yeah. when you look back over the seven decades, how has the organization evolved? has been a, a big evol evolution. Uh, first of all, we started with a very little number of countries, around 20. And now, today, we have 161. And the concept of standard has also evolved. We started by defining technical specification for things, for, for products. Okay. But then we moved to a different concept, which is technical specification for processes. And then we came up with uh, the very well-known ISO 9001, yes. where we define in a company, for example, what kind of processes you should follow in order to guarantee that you will have a high quality outcomes. The same thing with environmental protection, ISO 14001. So what kind of processes we should follow if we want to ensure everybody that we are uh, friendly with the environment? So that was the second and the third one is, is highly complex because the world is not a made with one single process. Now we have areas where we need to intervene not only from ISO but also other international organizations that have some, uh, something to say and also various stakeholders such as consumers or politicians, etc. And there is when we come to the concept such as smart cities, okay. which I know is very important for this country and is part of the key priority for Prime Minister Modi. Yes. Um, smart city means that we need to define certain rules that uh, will make the, our cities uh, friendly and successful. And th that is about buildings, that is about traffic, that is about um, energy. So a lot of very um, different concepts that uh, can make uh, the, the full concept 
uh, of smart cities something that makes sense to everybody. Absolutely, and uh, it is important for us to also note that 14th of October each year is observed as World Standards Day, and 14th October 2017 had yeah. that theme that standards make cities smarter. But yeah. do tell us, uh, Sergio, that how would a person understand which standard is good for his or her business? We have over 22,000 international, international standards. standards, and we produce every year around 1,000 standards. So the first need the first thing you need to know is that, that depending on the product, yes. depending on the process, depending on the area, you will have a number of international standards. So you need to first to um, understand uh, what is available up there. We have a catalog of 22,000 standards, as I said, which is well organized so you can identify the relevant standards for your business. So one can go to, say, the ISO website and oh, yeah. access the catalog of 22,000 international Absolutely. standards? Absolutely. You can and do that. Do, do they come for a price? Oh, yes, they come for a price because the system, uh, the standard development process has a cost. And we need to ensure the sustainability of the, of the system. We are not profit. We, we, wanna be, we don't want to be rich by doing international standards, but we want to guarantee the sustainability of the process. But do tell for organizations, say from the governance perspective, yeah. from risk management perspective, mm -hmm. what are the standards which you are seeing are getting popular in recent months? Well, the, the most popular, our flagship yes. is ISO 9001, which is about good management. Okay. And so you identify the key processes in your company, you create good documents, you um, educate people, you identify the risks you have, you address those risks, you mitigate those risks. So that's a, a, a really emblematic standard. There is another one on environmental protection, as I mentioned before, because this is a different world. People are not only buying things, they, all, they also need to be sure that they are being part of the solution or not, and not part of the problem when we're talking about environmental protection. So they do need assurance that at the process that are being followed by a specific company are environmentally friendly. So if a say company in India follows a national standard by BIS, yeah. they also have the option to follow the international standard by the ISO. Our, our, yeah, that's correct. Uh, our recommendation is that when possible you should go international. Okay. Why? Uh, because an international standard represents an international consensus of certain uh, group of rules. Uh, so if you follow international standard, that means that everybody in any country of the world will have the same language. That is the first dimension. But sometimes that is not enough because you need to capture the, the particularities of a region of a country. And so we also have some regional standards and we also have some national standards. So um, sometimes it's necessary to have small deviations from the uh, international standard to make sure that you actually adjust the standard to the reality of your country. So how do you see the regional cooperation? Say for example, India is part of SARC, the South yeah. Asian Association of Regional yeah. Cooperation. How do you see the awareness on the international standards from this region perspective? Well, it's, it's very good and I think that India has a, a great leadership within this region. Actually, one of the reasons why I came here yes. to India is to participate in that international meeting. Uh, so I, I want to express my, my appreciation uh, for the leadership that has been uh, pursued by India and by the uh, Director General of BIS. And it's, it's very important not only work at national level, but also expand that leadership to regional and also international uh, level. What we want to have from our members is a strong position so they can deliver at national level, but also at international level. What is really important here, when you have an international standard, you know it's going to affect you. Yes. Whether you like it or not, yes. it's going to affect your business. So what's the question here? Uh, you, do you want to be a standard taker, meaning that you use standards that are being developed by others, or you want to be a standard maker? And you do have the opportunity to influence the standards and to be a standard maker. So you better take that opportunity. But um, let's begin from the start. Okay. How does ISO select that there is a need for a fresh international standard in the market? First of all, ISO is not a building in Geneva. ISO is a system, and that system is composed by three key elements. The okay. first one is members, okay. as I said before. 160 we have plus. Exactly. Second is the central secretariat. 
in Geneva, where we offer a platform for the development of international standards. And the third one is the technical committees. We have over 300 technical committees composed of international experts, composed for by uh, stakeholders, also uh, by uh, national standard bodies. So how do we determine within this ecosystem where we need a new international standard? Yes. And the answer is very simple. One of our members make a proposal. Any member, any member can make the proposal. Any member can propose the development of a new standard. But as we work by consensus, the other member need to vote. Do you really think that we need this international, the new international standard? And if the answer is yes, okay, we start working together. So is it about majority, more than 50% voting yes? Consensus doesn't mean unanimity. In, in our interpretation, consensus is anything over uh, above 75%. Okay. So that's more or less the threshold we have defined to understand that there is a consensus. So how do you see partnership with India? India has uh, requested for some new standards in the past and India has taken lead in establishing international standards? Oh, definitely. India has a very strong position. India is the secretary, meaning that is the leader of the development uh, of standards in nine technical committees out of 300, which is very important. But India also participates in nearly 70% of the technical committees all around the world. That's one dimension, but it's not only that. The governance structure of ISO is basically an led by uh, what we call the council. Yes. A council is a dynamic steering group composed of 20 countries only, no 160 plus, okay. only 20. And one of those 20 countries is India, India. precisely. So we're very happy, very proud to have India uh, leading us as an international organization. And the third dimension is capacity building. Uh, because uh, when we talk about capacity building, and I had that discussion with your minister of, 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 of cost con consumers uh, early, uh, during the week, yes. um, and, and he mentioned that uh, we need more capacity building. And capacity building is not about charity, it's not about generosity, capacity building is about effectiveness. How, how do we make sure that this network, yes. composed of 160 plus countries, is really effective? If one of our members is not working well, well, that affects the whole system. Yes. So we need to, we better take care of everybody and make sure that they can deliver both at national and international level. And you mentioned about the Union uh, Commerce, uh, Union Consumer Ministry, under yeah. which the BIS comes. Yeah. We also saw India coming with the new BIS Act in 2016. Yeah. So do you think that um, India has taken progressive steps and you see that uh, the international standards are gaining importance in developing economies like India? Absolutely. Uh, my key message here is that international standards are a key component of national strategy for economic and social development. And many countries has followed that lead, that lead and including India. I'm very happy to see, uh, and this week I met with uh, various leaders, both government and industry leaders, that you are in the process of develop developing your national strategy for a standard. Yes. And, uh, and you will have our support, but you definitely are in the right track. So ISO does uh, do hand-holding and capacity building of member bodies? We do, we do. Uh, that's w one of our key tasks, to, to provide capacity building. But we do it in partnership with national standard bodies as well. Okay. I don't know if you were aware of this, but BIS has a very strong program of capacity building. Yes. So, so you not only benefit from the capacity building we provide, you also are capacity build there. And industry, if they have any idea, they also need to route it through BIS, which is the National Standards Body of India. But onto that process of formulating a standard, you said any member of the 160 plus could actually uh, propose, yeah. and then majority, which is about 75% plus, That's correct. have to vote. Then what's the next step when the technical committee is formed? What is the average duration by the time the standard is created? And it's around a, a little bit less than three years in average. It does, oh, take, it does time. take time. It does take a lot of time, but there is a reason for that. It would be very easy to develop a standard by the two of us yes. sitting on this table. Yes. But uh, that, that's not our way to work. Yes. We need to build consensus, but not any kind of consensus. We need to build global consensus. So it's a long process uh, where uh, somebody proposes a new standard, then you have technical committees, sub-technical committees, and working groups. The working groups are composed of the real expert mm. who do the actual drafting of okay. the standard. But then you need to come back to a national standard body to make sure that the opinion of that national standard body actually represent the whole ecosystem of that uh, country. So we have what we call the mirror committees. We have our international committee at ISO, but here in, 
each of the individual members of ISO, okay. you have your mirror committees to make sure that when you go to ISO and you vote, you not only represent your personal opinion, you represent the opinion of your country. And that is the beauty of the system, but that is why also it takes some time. And once the international standard is formulated, as you said, an average three years time frame, going forward as the dynamics of the business environment changes, they can also be revised? It, it, the st standards are revised uh, on permanent basis. Uh, what we need to make sure here is that the standards actually are responsive to market, to real market needs. So that's why they are uh, revised all the time. And we are in conversation with the Secretary General of ISO, Sergio Mukika. Sir, Prime Minister Modi has given a clarion call for Startup India, where mm -hmm. young entrepreneurs are encouraged to innovate. Mm -hmm. How do you see merging the innovation with international standards? Again, uh, standards are a key and indispensable component for innovation. Normally, people think that uh, standards are a set of rules, so it's very rigid, so it's very difficult to be innovative yes. if you have to follow those rules. The truth is, it's just the other way around. If you want to innovate, you need to scale up whatever you create. Yes. So if you follow standards, you will make sure that whatever you create, this new innovation, it's interconnected and is interoperable with other uh, products that actually exist already in the market. So if you want to scale up whatever you create, you need to use international standards. Sometimes the standards do not exist at the time you are developing your new uh, creation. Yes. So you can accompany the process with the development of international standards. And this is important, maybe it's too technical, but I'm going to clarify it anyway because I think it's necessary. Yes. A, a full international standard takes nearly three years to be developed. Yes. But there are some intermediate steps, such as what we call technical specifications or workshops that can take less than one year. So it depends on the deliverable you're looking for, the amount of time that it takes. But um, let us also focus on the MSME sector. That's the micro, small, medium sector. And especially in a developing economy like ours, uh, significant percentage, maybe 85, 90% of industry is mm -hmm. comprised of MSME. Do you think MSME can gain a lot from the international standards? I'm convinced that MSMEs can gain a lot from international standards. It represents an effort. Uh, and we need to be clear on that and we need to speak with the truth. It represents an effort, uh, but once you have implemented the standard, you are in a much better position to sell your products and to open up new markets. And you can export your products and everybody will understand that you can be trusted because you follow an international consensus. So it, it's a good investment, that's my message. So let's really recap some of the benefits uh, one can get because of an international standard. Mm. You said it'll enhance the credibility and open access to newer markets. That is correct. What yeah. other benefits accrue? Well, you improve your process. And you are uh, more efficient. You can save money by following the best practices, best international practices about management. And it is also a brand and it, your reputation. And you say that, you know, I follow in international standards. I follow in ISO standards. That means that I, I'm a good student. <laughs> I'm behaving very well. Okay. So that, that helps uh, also. And the fourth one has to do with consumers. Uh, consumers are very demanding today. They don't not only want a high quality product, they also, as I said before, want to be part of the solution and make sure that what they are buying uh, is in compliance with uh, international regulations, especially in the environmental area. Absolutely, because consumers with each passing day have become very demanding. Yep. And uh, there was a thought which said that uh, standards are like a, a language, a common language, yep. where you can establish trust. You can buy a product or a service across the globe sure. and you find a certain mark and there is a trust. Exactly. That's but the, yeah. uh, when we talk about standards, uh, one feels that the standards will be there on a particular product. So if I have, mm -hmm. say, a cell phone or sure. a pen on a good, you will find a standard. Yeah. Are you also seeing a pattern where the services are also having standards? Absolutely. There is a, a high area of, of new development of standards related to services. Actually, our General Assembly two years ago was mainly focused on, on the international standard being used as a framework, as a, a, a platform for, for services. So that is, is really important. And there are some technical committees which are 100% related to services, such as tourism, for example, where uh, we can do a lot by providing a common understanding of what kind of services we should provide within that industry. But how can we break, say for example, to uh, establish credibility in tourism sector? Mm -hmm. How would you map the services? How will I brand that I am an efficient tour service provider? Well, 
the first thing you need to do is to participate in the standard development process. So okay. you make sure that you have the right standards. Okay. Afterward, you implement those standards. And in some of the standards, you can also get a certificate to demonstrate to everybody that you are in compliance with the standards. So once an international standard is published by the ISO, yeah. anyone across the globe belonging to the uh, nations where we have a member body part of the ISO can subscribe to that standard yes. for a certain price. No, you can buy the standard for a certain price and then you have to implement it. Okay. That's a different story to make sure that you actually uh, do what you are supposed to do. And in some of those standards, you can also certify the compliance with the standards so you have an instrument to demonstrate to everybody that you are in compliance. So whether I'm complying with the international standard or not, uh, we have heard about the ISO audits and the conformity assessment. Yeah. That is also ISO's role? What we do is to create uh, standards for other organizations to certify. Okay. So we do not do the certification by ourselves. Okay. We create the standards for others to do it. Others as in, uh, say, the national body BIS probably would do it? No, no. This, this is the, the, the whole system. It's called a quality infrastructure. You have the standard development process. That's right. really important. Then you have an accreditation process yes. where some entities uh, apply to, for, to be accredited and be able to issue certificates. Right. So they need to comply with a certain standards or requirement to make sure that they have the, the, the adequate level. And the third component is the certification itself. So let's say a, a private entity that has been accredited, they can inspect and audit a company and then issue or not the certificate. So every country you are saying would probably create a good quality infrastructure. That's a key and indispensable component for economic and social development. It's not only about standard, it's also about the implementation of the standard. Let's now talk about the United Nations Sustainable Developmental Goals. Okay. I think everyone would agree that to accomplish and achieve those 17 SDGs, international standards will play an important role. So when we talk about sustainability of water, energy efficiency, yeah. how does one create standards here? This year we're going to have our General Assembly in Geneva, okay. in our headquarters. And so all 161 members will come to Geneva and the main topic is gonna be international standards in support of the implementation of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So we will have a very interesting conversation with the United Nations system, with other international organizations, and we will all try to build a good uh, consensus about how to support the implementation of the SDGs. That is one part. And the second part, we also need to map our 22,000 international standards to map them and classify them according to each of the SDGs. So when we're talking about, for example, water, water. Yeah. We all know what kind of standards are applicable to achieve that sustainable development goal. So, say for example, a consumer wants to buy a washing machine. Do you think that we will probably have a mark to tell whether that washing machine is energy efficient, uses optimal water, will be drilled down to such products? Th that is happening today. Okay. When you go to the supermarket, you can identify some, some seals or some marks that are, uh, guarantee you that the, the, the machine is actually friendly with the environment. So uh, once we segregate the 22,000 international standards that ISO yeah. has in different SDGs, then yeah. what's the next step? Well, to have an action plan and to inform. We cannot solve this problem by ourselves right. alone. Yes. We can be part of the solution. We can provide some tools. Yes. And that's what international standards are, are tools for the politician decision makers to uh, implement the SDGs. Right. Well, health is also an area which is of priority for everyone. And uh, when we talk about healthcare, there also ISO has come up with oh, uh, yeah. you know, 1,200 plus international standards. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. tell us more, uh, what are the priority areas there in health? Yeah, when we talk about international standard, I mentioned that we talk about an international consensus uh, for defining some technical specifications. Also, we talk about efficiency, how can we can have a, a system in place. But the third one has to do with society protection. Uh, so if uh, ISO standards are followed, yes. we make sure that we, we provide a guarantee to all the citizens, to the population, that uh, they will be well protected. And one of the dimensions of that protection has to do with healthcare. Right. Well, one of the segments on the program is also a fitness segment. So okay. on personal <laughs> level, uh, with all the stress that comes of managing 160 member countries and yeah. creating international standards, yeah. do you find time for yourself? 
Honestly, not at all. <laughs> no, no, I do find some time, but not uh, a lot of it. So I try to do bi bicycle and uh, I ski as well in the mountains of Switzerland. <laughs> Standards, they say, is a language to communicate in the global world. Today, we are in con conversation with the Secretary General of the ISO. Sir, um, let's talk about the economy of secondhand goods. So mm. once a good has been purchased and somebody wants to trade again, yeah. Uh, do we have the applicability of standards even then? No. The system as we have it, it doesn't have that dimension. Although we know that a first-hand good, if it has complied with certain standards, it will probably be still valuable and, and, and safe for, for, for the second use. Okay. And from the governance perspective, ISO is such a big organization, whether mm. it is your organization where you would like to have efficient governance or governance of any organization or nation per se, yeah. we have standards there as well. Yes, uh, the emblematic standard, our flagship, is ISO 9001, where uh, you uh, define a set of good principles uh, on governance and management of private companies, but also for the government. And there's the ISO 31000 as well, one on risk management? Yes, I, and you also have anti-bribery, anti -bribery. which is a very important dimension in many countries. As you, as you know, and so it, it's technical specifications, but also a good management. So even um, we have resolved for corruption-free India, how does uh, the ISO standard on anti-corruption, anti-bribery yeah. help yeah. a nation? How can an organization endorse such a standard? Well, what you have to do is to implement those standards because you need to work under the uh, idea that and those standards represent the international consensus of how bribery should be addressed and how can we as a country to avoid that risk. And one very important dimension of, of corruption is uh, awareness raising. We need to make this something which is not about government. It's about the, the whole of the society. It's government, industry, you need to, to tango. Yes. Somebody offer the yes. breath yes. and somebody accept it. Yes. So it's building consensus, building awareness to address this uh, very uh, important problem. So from a career perspective, especially for the youngsters who are watching the program this morning, um, what kind of aptitude is required for someone who was interested to create a standard? Well, uh, you need to have uh, the capacity to, to understand what kind of problem we yes. have in front of us yes. and then to make a concrete proposal. Uh, one very interesting area here, uh, it's uh, foresight activities. It, the problem is that some of the standards take long time to be developed and when we come up with our standard maybe it's not relevant anymore. So how can we anticipate uh, what are going to be the market needs in the future? Yes. So that's an indispensable area for us and where uh, university and research and centers can play a very important role. And the second challenge we have is we need to engage with younger generations. Yes. Uh, standards sound some, something a little bit old fashioned. <laughs> well, it's not <laughs> the case at all, but we need to make sure that open up a space for concrete participation to our young generations, but we also train uh, those leaders of the future. So would you say that one of the other uh, job responsibilities that you have in your uh, role as the chief executive of ISO is to ensure standards become glamorous and people associate and maybe uh, make more people aware at the school level itself about yeah. standards. I couldn't use the word glamorous, but uh, what we need to do is to explain in a simple manner the value and to demonstrate that value to everybody, to our leaders, to our and industry and representative on also the young generation to make it easy to understand. One of our key principles in our strategy is standards used everywhere. And the discussion I had with the minister during the week was, was very interesting because he said, you know, we need to make the standards simpler, yes. much easier to understand. And I couldn't agree more with that because some, some people think that they are very smart because they are speaking difficult and nobody understands them. <laughs> I, I think that is the other way around. If we want to be effective, we need to explain things in a simple manner. And that's one of the challenges we have. So uh, when you took this uh, position of uh, Secretary General of ISO in July 2017, yes. almost going to complete first year in office, yeah. uh, what will you say have been major accomplishments, outcomes of your first year tenure? Oh, well, I'm coming from outside the international standardization world. So one of my, my, my key challenges was to get to know the system, get to know the central secretariat and the key the key players. 
Uh, the second one is to have a strong voice from, from developing countries. And ISO is a global organization, and as such, uh, we need to represent all the various uh, priorities and regions of the world. So we, we need to make sure that uh, um, everybody has a voice, including developing countries. So that, that I think it, it has been a, a good accomplishment. We are enhancing our capacity building program with a more comprehensive approach. The risk we had in the past is that we provided a lot of workshops, like two, three days training. Right. So you go to a country, you provide your uh, workshop, and then have a nice life. <laughs> See you in, I don't know, 20 yes. years. Yes. Um, we need to come up with a more comprehensive approach. First, to understand what kind of challenges we're talking about. We don't want solutions looking for a problem. We need to identify the problems yes. first. Second, we need to create an action plan or a strategic plan to address those problems. And third, we need to deploy your strategy and to evaluate that you are being actually effective. So that's the main challenge we have in the area of capacity building, to come up with a comprehensive approach. And I'm very proud to say that ISO have moved in the right direction in that area. And would you say that uh, the member bodies of ISO are having a national strategy for standards? Many of them uh, do have a national strategy for standards, and that is uh, what uh, India is very busy now in okay. producing your, yes. your national strategy for standardization, and I think you are doing a, a very good job on that. And before your ISO role, you were with the World Customs Organization. Yes, I was the Deputy Secretary General of the World Customs Organization for nearly eight years. That is a, a very interesting organization as well. It's based in, in Brussels, Belgium. And what they do is to create standards, again, but in the area of international trade and custom procedures. The idea is to simplify and harmonize custom procedures all around the world. And, and before that, you worked with the Chilean government. Yeah, I, I'm Chilean. <laughs> I'm very proud Chilean. I come from the other side of the world. Yes. And uh, I worked for over uh, 20 years in the Chilean government in various capacity. I was, I was a director general of CASAT, but before that I was director general of the fisheries service, okay. which is a very big industry in my, in my country, and I also worked for the Ministry of Agriculture. But tell us more uh, uh, to the viewers of Art Severe. When we talk about Chile, I think my first recall is the soccer. But what else defines the country of Chile? Well, we produce very good wine, if you like wine. We produce salmon. Very good. Uh, and we are a big exporter of, of copper. Copper. Yeah. And what about music, Chilean music? Maybe not very well known, not like tango, but we do have our music. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that uh, if we request uh, Sergio Mukika, the Secretary General of ISO, who makes uh, mm. a thousand international standards a year to sing something for us, uh, Chilean music. Are you sure you want that? <laughs> <laughs> a line or two just to give the flavor to the viewers. Let me see. <laughs> uh, in Spanish. Okay, of course. Please. Yes. Yo vendo unos ojos negros. Quien me los quiere comprar, los vendo por hechiceros, porque me han pagado mal. I can have a second that, career. That's very <laughs> nice. You know, soy estudiante de español. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But still, for the benefit of viewers, can you translate uh, the meaning of the song? It is a love song and talks about uh, somebody who says that he's selling a black eyes uh, because he's in love and so on. Well, our guest today is Sergio Mukika, Secretary General with the International Organization for Standardization. So to recap, standards, are they mandatory? Are they voluntary? Standards are, are voluntary, normally, because it's, a, it's an invitation to excellence. Okay. And so if, if you want to comply with the law, that's fine, but that's a minimum. But I think that companies, I, I, if you want to be really efficient, if you want to be successful, you need to go beyond the minimum. You need to aim at the best practices all around the world. And that is all about standards, an invitation to excellence. And you would agree that uh, different nations use standards, uh, regulators use them, lawmakers use them. That is correct, and that is actually a very important dimension of our work. Okay. When we do, when do, when we create international standards, we also support public policy, and we also support the development of national regulations and laws. And and, and that is a very useful actually because the the the, the law development process, the law creation process, uh, can be very painful. Okay, I'm sure you are of aware <laughs> of that. That sometimes it takes two years, three years, five yes. years yes. to come up with a national law. When you 
based you are laws or you are regulation in international standards, you are sure that you are taking into account the best practices all around the world, and you are also taking into account account the, the, the opinion of all kind of stakeholders. Okay. So you buy acceptance and of the of the new law. And uh, that is a very important dimension. And the second one, and this is maybe too technical, but I'm gonna say it anyway. There is another international organization and you might be aware of is the World Trade Organization. Yes. The WTO. Yes. Well there are a number of conventions and uh, around the WTO and one of them is called the TBT technical barriers to trade. Okay. If we're talking about fair international trade, if we're talking about not putting barriers to the, the international trade, we need to ensure to all countries that the uh, standards I have, the regulation I have, are justified and they are not arbitrary. So if a country uses international standards to create technical regulations, they guarantee to the world that that technical regulation is not a technical barrier to trade. Okay, and we can say that, uh, like you said, standards are invitation to excellence. If somebody adopts the international standards, it also fosters world trade. That, that for sure, because when you use international standard, you are agreeing on a language yes. where everybody will understand. If we talk about certain quality, it's not only what I say, it's also what other countries are saying, so we can understand each other to have a much easier commerce. But uh, while you did explain that the technical committee is set and there are subcommittees as well, yet given there are different types of economies, developed economy, developing various nations, everyone's aspirations, it must be real challenging to you know, make even one international standard. <laughs> it is difficult, I, I, I agree with you, and uh, because well, we have many countries with competing and different priorities. But the beauty of the system is that you put together experts, yes. that's the key word, if you put together experts to discuss about a technical matter, and maybe painful, maybe difficult, but at the end of the day, you will come up with an international standard. And, and we can prove it because we actually do produce a thousand international standards every year. So over the last uh, year, um, what are the few international standards you would certainly like to highlight which have been published and you believe at company level they're very beneficial? Well, I think uh, the most important international standard we have created in the last few uh, months is the one related to, to public health and, and safety, uh, where you define a number of specifications to, to protect people uh, and when you talk about a company many times you only refer to or we only refer to efficiency productivity yes. sales etc yes. but what about our people what about our workers mm. uh, are there best practices around the world mm. that we can implement in mm. my company to ensure that my workers will be well protected mm. and uh, and the answer is yes there are best practices out there and if you invest in your people in your workers you will be investing also in your company and apart from ethical reasons which are absolutely uh, valid there there are also commercial re uh, reasons because if you protect well your people your people will be better motivated and you will have people that will put all their energy all the heart in what they're doing so, Sergio, even as we come to conclude our conversation, what is the future pattern that you see across the globe regards international standards? What I see is more international uh, cooperation in very complex topics. And ISO cannot solve complex topics on our own. We need to engage with others, for example, IEC or other international organizations. If we talk about artificial intelligence, Yes. if we talk about Internet of Things, yes. if we talk about smart cities, we need to create a platform where all the relevant players come here and make their they, they, they contribution. Um, the challenge here is that everybody likes coordination, but nobody likes being coordinated. So when we propose, when we offer the platform, we need to have the capacity to bring actors from all different fields and to offer them a, a neutral platform where everybody will be well represented. So that is the job of the Central Secretariat based out of Geneva to coordinate all the member bodies. Exactly. So when we have an international standard, it also has an embedded technology that is agreed upon, uh, whether it is artificial intelligence, blockchain, everything. Yeah, in, ma in many cases the standards are about, uh, are about technical specifications and also about technology. And interesting you mentioned about the other organization, IEC. Help us understand there is the ISO, 
And yeah. then there is the IEC, and we hear yeah. about ITU as well. ITU is about telecommunications, and IEC is about uh, electronics, yeah. So all three combined work for international standards? Oh, yeah, definitely. Actually, in the area of smart cities, we have a specific agreement, the three international organizations, and we organize joint activities. For example, this year we organize a, a big international forum on smart cities in the city of Barcelona. Okay. So we're doing a lot of things together. And one of the other things that the viewers would certainly love to know from uh, you is that time and again, ISO organizes competitions audio competitions, video competitions, poster competitions. I remember in 2014 when World Standards Day theme was being selected, which was yeah. standards play a level field, uh, mm -hmm. there was a competition and somebody had sent this dice with six on all yes, sides. Yes, that is, that is correct. We, we organized those competitions. As we were trying to do is to create awareness in the international community that the standards are very important. And one of the things we, we can use to create such an awareness are precisely an international competition. But we also participate in international competitions. Oh, we do? Yeah, yeah. For example, this year, uh, the ITU, IEC, and ISO working together developing international standards for video recording, we won an Emmy. Oh, well, uh, congratulations. So we are very proud of that. Excellent. So what are the immediate next goals that you set for your own personal life? Well, uh, organizing our next General Assembly, which will be held in, in, in Geneva. So uh, that's going to be a lot of work for us. And what's the best piece of advice that you've received in your career? What keeps you going? What keeps you motivated? What's your philosophy of life? I think my key priority in, in, in my professional life has to do with uh, the creation of consensus and the importance of multilateralism. Uh, we have big and serious problems in yes. our world. And nobody, nobody can solve those problems on his own. Mm. And it's not who goes first or second or mm. third. It's as we working together, create a platform and we create a solution for, for all countries. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure uh, talking to you, Sergio. And as you said, standards is an invitation to excellence for extending that invitation to our viewers on the program at Savere. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. My pleasure. So that was the Secretary General of the International Organization for Standardization, Sergio Mukika. And uh, now, of course, we'll get you today's history. On this day in 1737, the Marathas under Bajira I attacked and defeated the Mughals in the Battle of Delhi. Film actor Akshay Khanna was born on this day. So we wish a very happy birthday to Akshay Khanna. Have a lovely day ahead. Namaskar.